Welcome back. We have a great podcast and video cast from Larry Kobach, who is a lawyer as well as a physician on behalf of the Pain Societies of the Carolinas, Pennsylvania, New York, Tennessee, and Pennsylvania, brought to you by Robin Hoyle. I want to thank them for allowing me to rebroadcast this great talk. I also have a lot of great events coming up on the NRAP Academy's platform. Our calendar starts off with January 28th. We have a regenerative medicine course in New York City and on Zoom. So if you can't make it in person, you can register at painexam.com slash events on the Zoom link. We also have ultrasound training in Tamarindo, Costa Rica in February. We also have three more courses in New York, March 11th, April 22nd, and June 11th. Now, June 11th is the piggyback off of the board review course, the pain management board prep that we did last year, Al Abdul Al Said, myself, under the flag of the International Pain Academy. It was a great course, and I hope to see you guys there. Any questions, shoot me an email. And if you can't make any of the courses or you want to learn online, just go to painexam.com, anesthesiaexam.com, and the newly re renovated, redone pmrexam.com. The NRAP Academy also features an ultrasound gallery on the website, and I'm still working on it, but it's up, nrappain.org. Check it out. And without further ado, here's Larry Kovac. Good day, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you at our uh, webinar concerning the new CDC guidelines for the treatment of pain. It just came out less than a month ago as this is being recorded. I'd like to pay special thanks to uh, Robin Hoyle, the executive director of the Pain Society of the Carolinas, the Pain Society of Tennessee, the uh, Pennsylvania Pain Society, and the New York State Pain Society uh, for making this possible. So let's get right to it because there's a lot to cover. As you may know, um, this, this guideline is a result of the problems that were, were, that, that were seen with the 2016 CDC guidelines for pain. This particular uh, guideline covers more than the original guidelines because it also includes acute and subacute as well as chronic pain. All right, the prior guideline was only for chronic pain. Uh, the chronic pain being more than three months, subacute one to three months, and acute pain, anything uh, one month or less, such as post-operative pain or uh, fracture pain, something of that nature. All right, these guidelines still do not include uh, nor are they meant to include end-of-life pain, such as uh, cancer-type pain, uh, pediatric pain are not included, all right? And that's, uh, that's important to note. All right. Now, the basis of these new guidelines is what allegedly is new evidence that has surfaced since 2016. And I personally think more than new evidence, it's misuse of the prior guidelines concerning tapering, Maximum allowable dose, we have that net, that, that the magic number of 90 uh, morphine equivalent units, uh, which is no longer used in these guidelines. There's going to be a new magic number, 50, but it's used differently than the 90, so please don't confuse the two. The prior guidelines, virtual prohibition of mixing opioids with benzos, uh, as well as the uh, various administrative bodies using the prior guidelines of standard of care as, it voced, as opposed to something simply advisory. These are guidelines, not standards of care. However, I have to warn everybody listening to this, that uh, various state boards, as well as uh, judges, et cetera, will tend to use these guidelines more as standards of care than guidelines. So beware, beware. All right. Um, now, General considerations before we start anything. By the way, the good Lord uh, found it necessary only to give us uh, 10 commandments, but the CDC has found it necessary to give us 12 parts of these uh, guidelines, and uh, we'll, we will proceed accordingly, stressing each of the 12 and then giving commentary on most of them. Keeping in mind that these guidelines are considerably longer than the original CDC guidelines, uh, they're more than twice the length of the original CDC guidelines. So by its very nature, we're not going to be able to give a comprehensive uh, review of, of every page in the guideline. That just would take too much time. But we'll hit the highlights. It's important to note that uh, these guidelines are not meant to apply to the pain management specialist. And is a huge however. 
because you call yourself a pain management specialist does not necessarily mean that you'll be recognized by a government entity as a pain management specialist. Uh, in the various states, they will uh, actually define what they, they consider a pain management specialist. Uh, often it has to do with board certifications and things of that nature, uh, the appropriate continuing medical uh, education. Uh, as well as the type of clinic or office you're working with or for and, and how long. So you have to really find out in your individual jurisdictions, your individual states, how a uh, specialist, a pain management specialist is defined. That's pretty important because if you hold yourself out to be a pain management specialist and feel that these guidelines don't in its entirety apply to you uh, and you don't have the appropriate credentials, that, that could be problematic uh, down the road. That's an important point that I think everyone should realize. Okay, now let's get to recommendation one after all that introduction. Um, and just let it know that in addition to being an attorney, I am also, I also was a practicing clinician. I was a podiatrist. I still am a licensed podiatrist, but I was an active practice oh, for 25 years. So I, I have used opioids. I'm board certified, uh, actually a diplomate in the... Uh, by the AAPM back from the the eighties, and um, that's the nineteen eighties, and uh, we'll be able to go into this in, in, in enough detail to give you a good introduction. The actual uh, guidelines are downloadable and quite readable from the CDC website. Please feel free to uh, go there. All right. The recommendations that I have here, or uh, one through twelve, are actually word for word from the recommendations in the actual guidelines. Now, recommendation one is not opioid therapies, or at least as effective as opioids. That's pretty similar to the old recommendation. For many common types of acute pain, clinicians should maximize use of non-pharmacological and non-opioid pharmacological therapies as appropriate for the specific condition and patient, and only consider opioid therapy for acute pain if benefits are anticipated to outweigh the risks to the patient. Let me stop there. What I see lacking in many of the charts that I review as an attorney is that consideration within the medical record of the benefits outweighing the risks. You have to deal with the risks of the individual patients. We'll get into that a lot as, as this uh, hour progresses, but your chart has to lay that out, okay? Uh, it's not enough just to say, yeah, you told the patient the risks, you did a, an informed consent before you gave the uh, the opioid prescription. You have to write down what you did, all right? Because if you didn't, if you all heard this before, if you didn't write it, you didn't do it, and it's better to write it. It will save yourself a lot of headaches down the road. Okay, so before prescribing an opioid therapy for acute pain, clinicians should discuss with their patients the realistic benefits and known risks of opioid therapy and certainly opioid tolerance, opioid abuse, even death uh, is, is are known risks of opioid therapy, especially if there's abuse involved or if there are uh, patients also taking benzos, which we'll get into more later, uh, later in this uh, presentation. Now, also for recommendation one, uh, <clears throat> it does not. Uh, it, 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 it means that not that you can't use opioids, but they have to be appropriate. So for a fractured little toe that's non-displaced, not quite sure in most cases if opioid therapy is, is uh, really indicated, unless someone has a very, very low tolerance to pain. That, that would be an extreme example, but uh, let, let's take that into consideration. And that recommendation two of... Uh, expands on recommendation one by saying again that non-opioid therapies are preferred for subacute and chronic pain and that you the clinician should maximize your use of these therapies <clears throat> initiating opioid therapy is fine if the benefits again outweigh the anticipated risks now again before starting opioid therapy discuss with your patient the risks and the realistic benefits of opioid therapy and what the patient's goals are as far as pain and function and um, 
how you're going to discontinue the use of opioids when the benefits don't outweigh the risks or the pain has disappeared or disappeared enough that it's not necessary anymore. Now, here's an important point with recommendation number two. These guidelines, and this is written within the guidelines, they don't require that you sequentially fail non-pharmacological and non-opioid pharmacological therapy required to use any specific treatment before proceeding to opioid therapy. Let me give you an, an, an actual example of that. You've performed um, lower back surgery or, uh, or procedure in the lower back such that you know that on the average patient, they're going to need, uh, they're going to be in pain uh, post-procedure. And they may need for a short period of time opioids. You could go right to the opioids. You don't have to, before the, before the anesthesia is over, put them on, on a set of minifin or, uh, or uh, an NSAID. Um, to uh, and then find that it fails because they're in agony and then have to put them on opioids. That's not what these recommendations mean. And that's how the prior uh, recommendations in 2016 is one of the reasons how they were not understood well. All right. So someone's got a, a you know, a fractured uh, heel or a, uh, or a hip. They're going to probably need opioids. You don't have to first try something that's not opioid and see if it's going to do the trick, unless there's a real reason why the patient shouldn't be taking opioids for uh, they, they, they react uh, poorly or go into respiratory arrest with uh, morphine type substances. That's different. <coughs> so use your medical uh, knowledge to the advantage of the patient. Okay. Now, here's another point that I think we have to uh, take an extra second or two, if not longer, many of the patients you are seeing don't come to you being opioid naive. As a matter of fact, many of them come to you already on pretty substantial MMEs on opioids. Clinicians seeing new patients already receiving opioids, yes, you should uh, establish treatment goals and functional goals and goals for discontinuing or at least reducing your, the opioid the dosage. But clinicians should avoid rapid tapering or abrupt discontinuation of opioids. Cold turkey is not where this is going, and a rapid taper is not what this is recommending. All right? So let's get that straight, and let's get that off the table, because that's a that was a big issue in the 2016 uh, 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 guidelines. <clears throat> it just... Okay. Recommendation number three. And they do call them recommendations. They're not commandments. So just by the mere fact of what they're called, it, it, it's, it sounds more like a guideline than, than a standard of care. When starting opioid therapy for acute, subacute, or chronic pain, clinicians should prescribe immediate release opioids instead of extended release opioids. Well, I know what's coming. And if it's not, it should. Many... Insurance companies will not pay for the extra cost, cost of immediate release opioids. Patients often can't afford out-of-pocket costs for immediate release opioids. Some of them, frankly, are very expensive. What do you do? Well, you do the best you can do when you give them a, uh, if need be, an extended release or something, some other substitute that's the second best. And you chart the reason why you're not giving the immediate release opioids. Put it in your records. Don't leave it for explanations down the road that you have to get a copy of the patient's policy or a copy of the letters. Yes, it's very important. And you should have a copy of the denial letter if you can get it, uh, that where they're not allowing the, uh, the immediate release opioid, where they're not going to pay for it. Explain in your records that the patient told you they could not afford the cost of this medication out of pocket. If they were already on Medicaid, uh, uh, you could put that down as an explanation, as evidenced by the patient being on Medicaid, they couldn't afford for the out-of-pocket expense. If the patient just simply tells you they can't afford it, put that in the chart. You're under no obligation to, to perform a, uh, a uh, colonoscopy of their, of their finances, to be blunt about it. You have enough responsibilities as a physician or a medic or or a medical provider as it is. So 
Uh, again, let me emphasize your chart must emphasize and write, and you have it in the records. Write it down, type it down, keyboard it down, whatever term you want to use, why you are not giving them the immediate release. All right? And this is an issue for many patients. Moving right along, recommendation number four. And we, we kind of touched on this uh, just before. If opioids are initiated for opioid naive patients with acute, subacute, or chronic pain, clinicians should prescribe the lowest effective dose. This is kind of the opposite of when we just covered that patients come to you with uh, higher MMEs. <laughs> so if opioids are continued for subacute or chronic pain, clinicians should use caution when prescribing opioids at any dosage. Well, that's nothing new. Uh, and you should carefully evaluate individual benefits and risks when considering increasing the dosage and should avoid increasing dosage above levels likely to yield diminishing returns in benefits relative to risks to patients. We're getting close to that new number 50, actually, and um, let, let's cover that a little bit. The 50 uh, MMEs, or morphine equivalent units, MEUs, uh, that's the new number, the new magic number. It doesn't replace a, a 90. Uh, but it, it's this is a number that when you hit that number, pause, and as they used to say, stop, look, and listen, and carefully go over is your patient, uh, are there other situations where you have to take careful evaluations, such as the patient has uh, trouble breathing, sleeping, uh, the patient is on benzodiazepine, uh, or other medications that might potentiate the uh, the side effects of the opioids. 50 is their magic number. And you should be aware of when you're prescribing a dose of whatever uh, opioid you're using, what the morphine equivalents are for that dose and other potentiating medications. So stop, look, and listen when you hit the 50 MEUs or 50 MME, same thing, okay? Uh Let's see. So especially when you hit uh, that with your prescriptions, if you hit that 50 MME dosage, your charting should uh, make the reader aware, whether it's you, someone else in your office, some uh, administrator from the state or federal government that will review your charts down the road, that you were quite aware at this state, on this date, when the prescription was changed, that you were aware that this patient hit the 50 MMEs, and you went over, again, and perhaps in even more detail, the possible side effects, especially the deleterious ones that, that could uh, result with patients at that 50 MMEs. Very important. Now, also, Certain states require clinicians to implement clinical protocols that are specific to dosage levels. So, for example, I believe in Tennessee and Washington state, uh, when the patient hits 120 MMEs a day or greater than, uh, they're required to uh, get a consultation from a pain specialist as defined by that state. The credentials are defined by that state. All right. Now, if you already have those credentials, you don't really need to get a uh, consultation. But be aware of those credentials. Can't go into all 50 states and what's required. That, that would, again, be beyond the scope of this particular lecture. All right. That, these are important items, and uh, it's a lot to digest in one, uh, one sitting. Recommendation number five. All right. For patients already receiving opioid therapy, they're not opioid naive clinicians should carefully weigh the benefits, risks, exercise, and care when changing opioid dosage, when changing opioid dosage. So when you change the dosage, don't do it cavalierly. Uh, have a reason written in your records, and I sound like a broken record, and that's on purpose. Chart why you're raising the dosage and what benefit, hopefully, if any, uh, hopefully the sum that you hope to achieve by raising the dosage some kind of note of why the prior dosage is no longer or not doing the trick. Patient can't function in a particular way. Don't talk in generalities. Try to get down in the dirt with specifics if you can. All right. 
uh, patient was in too much pain, uh, when walking even half a block, that kind of thing. And talk about the goals that are trying to be achieved by increasing the dosage. Increasing the dosage can be done by either increasing the amount of pills taken or the amount of uh, uh, milligrams per pill. Right. Now, if benefits don't weigh outweigh the risks, clinicians should optimize other therapies, physical therapy. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of other therapies, you name it, and work closely with patients to gradually, gradually taper to lower dosages or if warranted based on individual circumstances, appropriately taper and discontinue the opioids. Now, unless there are indications of a life-threatening issue, such as warning signs of impending overdose, opioid therapy should not be discontinued abruptly and clinicians should not rapidly reduce opioid dosages from higher dosage. You know, we're talking about slow tapers, we're talking maybe 10% a month or so. And uh, they will say, uh, it comes a little later uh, in these guidelines, but I'll mention it now, that for the longer period of time and the higher amounts that the patients have been on opioids, the, the, the taper will take a longer period of time to taper, as opposed to if they were just on the opioids a few months. Okay. Now, This you could read as well as I can. And I don't know that it really, when we say that, uh, don't give more than is necessary. I'm thinking of a chart that I once reviewed from an orthopedist who was treating a, a friend of mine, uh, his daughter in law, as it turned out, I'm not mentioning any names or states. And she had a fractured pinky, not even, a, not a toe, a finger, a fractured pinky, a simple fracture, non displaced. Didn't require any setting surgery or anything else. Just to, you know, to, to set it next to the uh, fourth uh, finger, and prescribe the bottle of hundred Percocet. I would have problems, uh, frankly, from a legal point of view, uh, and from even a medical point of view, of uh, why so many were prescribed at the time. In most states, a uh, quantity, excuse me, a quantity that number may not even be allowed anymore and the current uh, guidelines. So keep that in mind. You don't want to just cavalierly give out tremendous quantities of various opioids. All right. And, uh, let's see. Let's get to number seven. And we're moving along here at a nice pace. Number seven reads, clinicians should evaluate benefits and risks with patients within one to four weeks of starting opioid therapy for subacute or chronic pain or of dosage escalation. Clinicians should regularly reevaluate benefits and risks. What is this telling you? Obviously, besides the good medicine involved in this, it's telling you when you reevaluate it, your record should, should reflect that. What was done as part of the reevaluation? Asking the patients questions if they're having trouble sleeping, if they're having trouble breathing, if they're having trouble with speech, if they're having trouble uh, operating heavy machinery, the usual, you know, uh, or, or writing perhaps, or, or just being uh, alert. These are questions that should be asked. Um, perhaps you may want to do several uh, clinical. Uh, easy exam, clinical examination to, to substantiate that the patient is, is uh, okay uh, on the, uh, on the uh, opioids at this stage. And again, they say within one to four weeks, more often is better than less often with these, these reevaluations. It's as simple as that. Saying you reevaluate a patient is not the same as you did, and it has to be appropriately charted right now. This uh, is part of recommendation seven. It gets into uh, uh, remote visits, all right, which during the COVID situation, we've uh, mostly all of us have become uh, more familiar with. In practice, contacts with virtual visits are part of the standard uh, of your standard care, not the standard of care, but standard care. Um, you want to be very careful to assess these patients as best as possible through communication and, and observation if, if they have a screen available. 
Obviously, if you could see the patient, that's better than just talking to the patient. But even if you're just talking to the patient, you want to evaluate them for any signs of depression, anxiety, other psychological comorbidities. And if you find that they have any psychological comorbidities, you want to make sure that they're under treatment of a psychologist or psychiatrist because treatment for these other conditions will help to optimize your treatment for pain. Uh, studies have shown that, that, that they truly can make a, a big, big difference. If the, if, now here's another thing. I have heard that many rural areas, psychologists and psychiatrists, especially that uh, accept Medicaid, Medicaid, I should say, or Medicaid, when, you know, the various insurances, uh, can be very difficult, if not impossible. So if you're trying to get them into a program or, or with a, a, an appropriate clinician, your chart should so reflect, and it should reflect your follow-up in this regard, and the patient's follow-up in this regard. And if the patient fails to follow up, you want to remind them of that of the next visit and short that too. If you're sensing a theme to my recommendations concerning uh, your uh, charting of everything, you, you are sensing correctly. <clears throat> Apologize, I'm just getting over a pretty bad cold, so bear with me. All right, so... Let's see. Recommendation number eight. Before starting and periodically during the continuation of opioid therapy, we're back to clinicians should evaluate risk for opioid-related harms and discuss the risk with patients. Clinicians should work with patients to incorporate into the management plan strategies to mitigate risk including offering nal naloxone, especially with patients on more than 50 MMEs per day, 50 or more. Okay, now, so now we get into naloxone, and especially if 50 or more, strongly consider making the naloxone available to your patients. Strongly consider. All right, because naloxone has saved a lot of lives. Clinicians should ask patients about their drug and alcohol use and use various validated tools, many of which you could find right on the CDC website and on your various state uh, Department of Health websites, or, and or consult with behavioral specialists to screen for and assess mental health and substance use disorders. Now, I have to tell you, on many practitioners treating pain, more than one like to give Adderall and medications of that nature to patients on uh, opioids that they diagnosed as having a attention deficit disorder or adult attention deficit disorder or ADDH. That's better left unless you know how to really to, to uh, diagnose that and give the reasons why. It's better left being diagnosed and treated by a psychiatrist. Okay, so think carefully before you just dispense some uh, amphetamines to a patient that you think has attention deficit disorder. And if you do make that diagnosis, uh, the patient should be worked up through various tools to fill out to make sure that they have the various uh, have the various parts of a, a true diagnosis of attention deficit disorder, not just something you think or you know it when you see it. That's not enough especially you're giving the patient uh, an amphetamine along with an, uh, with an opioid, you're putting the patient at increased risk. So you want to be careful with that. You know, you don't want to do that unless you have to. And if you have to do it, you want the, the dosage of the medication for the ADDH or the dosage for the medication for treatment of depression or anxiety to, uh, to be managed appropriately by an expert. And unless you're an expert managing uh, benzos and various uh, types of other medications for patients with these other psychiatric um, uh, 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 diagnoses, then make the appropriate referral when you possibly can. If you can't, then make the diagnosis through appropriate evaluation, and that appropriate evaluation must be charted, please. Okay. Now, it does say also as part of recommendation eight within the guidelines, because I'm not going over all 90 pages, each guideline has a lot of commentary. 
it's uh, it's almost biblical. There's a lot of commentary on each line. Clinicians should avoid prescribing opioids to patients with moderate or severe sleep disorders or breathing disorders whenever possible to minimize risk for respiratory depression. Well, you only notice by asking the patient as far as sleep disorders. I mean, if need be, get a sleep study on a patient if you think that there, there's a possible problem. It's not that difficult these days to get a sleep study. You have to try to get, you have to try to at least get your patient to cooperate with, uh, with getting a sleep study. If they refuse, then note it in your chart and, and keep all your records that you tried to prescribe it or you did prescribe it and, and put the, the results in your chart. Scan it in if you have to, so it's part of your uh, electronic medical records, or just keep a copy if, if you use paper records still. All right, and that's, that's important. That's something that's overlooked a lot. Pregnant persons with opioid use disorder, medication for opioid use disorder, uh, to get off of them, such as buprenorphine or methadone, those are the two recommended therapies according to uh, this particular set of guidelines and should be offered as early as possible in a pregnancy to prevent harm to both the patient and the fetus. Patients with jobs that involve potentially hazardous risks, uh, you know, such as uh, people in the building trades, um, people that need to work in great detail with their hands. Uh, you have to be very careful as far as uh, that you have to balance their other medications, such as th th their cognition and their balance and coordination should not be uh, unduly impaired. And you have to be part of that and warn them as far as uh, what it might do. You have to uh, access the data from the PDMP, the various uh, data bases that virtually every state now has access to, certainly in the states of the various pain societies that, that we're reaching out to today. Um, you have Each time you make a prescription, you should be accessing that information. Make sure they're not getting prescriptions from their dentist. Uh, that could totally screw up your your, your own treatment. Uh, that put it put it in the danger zone. <laughs> Make sure they're not getting uh, prescriptions from other physicians, including psychiatrists that you're not aware of. That could put various uh, uh, various recommendations that you have to make into the danger zone. You want to be working with these other providers, not not uh, not in ignorance of them. The fact that they claim they don't know about you is no excuse, as long as you know about them. And you will know about them if you access these databases. Keep in mind also you want to access, most states now have access to the uh, and include uh, neighboring states as part of their uh, database. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, a patient from New York could easily get uh, medication in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut. That's not unheard of. If they're in the Buffalo area from Ohio, West Virginia, keep that in mind. Okay. Now, let's see. Let's get to the next slide. Now, again, the sleep situation, the sleep apnea is extremely important. I don't hear enough about this in many of the lectures uh, uh, that I attend concerning opioid use. And it does come up frequently in state board hearings and in malpractice situations. So there was an actual study of veterans, and this study is referred to uh, in within these guidelines. All right, uh, and it, it goes into it, and, uh, and the study is available if you need to download it. But uh, it found that sleep apnea was associated with increased risk for life-threatening respiratory depression or overdose when people are on opioids. So titration of your dosage of opioids has to be uh, has to be done very carefully and not cavalierly. Uh, that says flat out clinicians should avoid prescribing opioids to patients with moderate to severe sleep disordered breathing. Sleep studies can be very helpful when it comes to this and, and not only protecting your backside, but protecting the patient, which is always real, which is always number one, which is always number one. Another, and, and this, uh, this, uh, I was just commandment number eight, the recommendation number eight, it's a very, very important one. So we're going to spend a little time digging down on number eight. Don't worry, we'll get finished on time. People over 65 years of, old, of age, that's me. 
people like us have increased risk for undertreating their pain. <coughs> okay, we really haven't touched that before. These guidelines don't want your pain undertreated. Keep that in mind. You know, people, especially that are older, that are in a lot of pain and the pain is undertreated, they run the risk of, of a stroke from intense pain. Increase risk to these patients when using both opioid and non-opioid pharmacological therapies. Let's take an example. Uh, depending on, you know, they can work on your liver, your kidney, and, and the last thing you want is have a kidney shut down or liver failure. That, that could be pretty uh, pretty bad especially for someone over 65. So you want to watch out for patients with decreased renal function before you put them on various medications. Because if the kidneys are not working uh, to their capacity, there's a, there's a possible uh, susceptibility to accumulation of multiple meds because of that. And they're not, they won't be cleared from the body. People over 65 are easier to overdose. And again, people over 65 have an increased risk to respiratory depression. So let's see. Let me show we get everything. But before we get to nine, let's get back to eight for a second. A point that the guidelines make in their commentary is patients. Uh, if patients experience a non-fatal opioid overdose, clinicians should evaluate them for opioid use disorder and provide or arrange treatment if needed. Now, you can only provide the treatment for opioid use disorder if you're qualified to treat it. That, that's a separate area of expertise. So don't be afraid to refer these patients. Treatment with buprenorphine or methadone, again, are, are the preferred two uh, ways of treating such patients. And um, let's see, clinicians should work with patients to reduce opioid dosage and discontinue opioids when indicated and should ensure that continued monitoring and support of patients prescribed or non-prescribed uh, opioids. Monitoring is, is, is of the utmost here. Now, monitoring is not just seeing the patient every week or two or three. It's what happens during those visits that you see them every week or two or three, which is very, very important. Okay, let's go to number nine. When prescribing initial opioid therapy for acute, subacute, or chronic pain, and periodically during your therapy for chronic pain, you should review the patient's history of controlled substances, uh, prescriptions, again, with the PMP. We, we kind of covered that. And see whether the patient's receiving opioid dosages or combinations that put the patient at extra risk. That's important. Uh, can't stress that enough. Now, here's something. Uh, patients, and this is in the CDC commentary, and this is this is very important because this is a very practical uh, problem that has shown up in many of the uh, uh, investigations of various states. And this is evidence that I think you'll uh, be able to use if need be. Clinicians do not should not dismiss patients from their practice solely on the basis of the PDMP information by the, the guidelines. So doing so could adversely affect your patient's safety and could result in missed opportunities to provide potentially life-saving information. And they say example given about the risks of prescription opioids, and, you know, basically to use that as an opportunity to read them the riot act in a, uh, educational way in a non-threatening way so that if the patient you see is getting uh, other medication from other practitioners don't say well you know you, you've broken a drug contract goodbye because they're going to wind up on the street with heroin fentanyl crack you'll wind up with a dead former patient uh, the guidelines have dramatically changed in this regard. They were aware of what occurred. They didn't put this in the actual recommendation. They put it in the commentary of the recommendation. You know, very often it's those little asterisks or little footnotes where the important things are, are seem to be hidden. And this is one of them. So that if the, by itself, if the patient is getting uh 
medication elsewhere, polypharmacy from, from other physicians or healthcare providers, mid-levels. That's not reason enough in and of itself to dismiss the patient, even though you may have a contract. But again, your chart must reflect what you did as a route that A, you saw in the PDMP, PMP, I stopped, the, they have, there's different names in different states. But you, you, the, I'm sure you're aware of it, exactly what's going on and what you did about it. it. May also involve calling the other prescriber and making them aware of it. Okay? And, and again, chart all of this. If you chart all of this, I not, listen, I can't guarantee you anything, but I can guarantee you that, that they will uh, take a uh, hard look at your records before they want to prosecute or, or really go after you. If you have records that, that dig that, that far down into the weeds, because there'll be plenty of other practitioners whose records will not. It'll take you a little longer at the end of the day, but you'll sleep better at night. You'll pass your own sleep study. All right, let's see. Let's get to number 10. We're making good progress. When prescribing opioids for subacute or chronic pain, clinicians should consider the benefits and risks of toxicology testing to assess for prescribed medications, as well as other prescribed and non-prescribed controlled substances. Now, notice I put in capitals, pay attention to local or state rules and LCDs, the local uh, Medicare rules, because they can dig down into the weeds as far as the type of UDTs, urinary uh, drug testing that should be performed, whether uh, screening, and usually uh, they just advise screening every so often, or if there is a reason. Some states actually uh, want you to classify the patient as uh, high risk, medium risk, low risk, and then get, get different amount of times that you should, or that they'll pay for a uh, toxicology test uh, based on uh, your analysis. And many of the charts in those areas don't have that analysis. It's lacking, so it's a problem. Some offices just give a, a screening test literally every visit. Others from time to time give unannounced which generally are the best. Um, but your initial test, unless there's a very good reason, uh, should be a screening test, not for specific substances, but just a screening test. All right, and see if the, what's happening with this patient. All right, now how often? These guidelines don't dig that deep. Uh, I will say that on most patients, it should be more than once a year, but it should be less than, than, than once a month. Uh, as a generality, each patient is specific. If a patient tells you that they uh, they fell off the wagon or they used this, that, or the other thing, and many of the patients will actually tell you, they'll be honest with you, they, they trust you. Um, use this as an educational opportunity. So again, and they actually say it, Based just on the fact that the patient has flunked a, a drug screening test one time is not a reason, nor should it be a reason to get rid of them from the practice. Uh, again, they're aware at this stage, at least the, the CDC is, that many people needlessly died because they were let go from practices and they wound up taking street drugs. And uh, that's not to the benefit of anybody. That's not to say that they could flunk these tests indiscriminately time after time. You do virtually nothing, and they're not uh, uh, removed from the practice eventually. If after two, there's no number given, but after two, three, four, five times the patient has gotten multiple chances, you've attempted to uh, to taper. And the patient just won't do it. And by the way, you want to note that if that's the case, you want to. A, 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 Every time you attempt to do anything, you want to note it. And uh, before you dump a patient, you give them the benefit of the doubt, give them another chance. Many of these patients, if not most of them, are really not, not having the uh, luckiest days of their lives while they're uh, coming to you. So, you know, bend over backwards, but don't be a doormat. And, you know, there's no right or wrong here other than 
it's a uh, it's a moving finish line, so to speak. And you do you do the best you can, and you want your chart to reflect that. So, you know, when would you get rid of a patient? Well, if they're diverting and selling medication, that's pretty serious because then they're taking you a prescription for them, and then they could be hurting others. Children could be getting that. If they're using themselves, again, you want to be as educational as possible. All right. So that's, again, there's no firm, hard answers. This is when it comes to the art of medicine as opposed to the science of medicine. What is better for the patient in the long run? I recently had a, uh, a client on a on pretty stiff investigation by the state. The state shall be nameless. And the doctor uh, really was uh, was treating people that were just the dregs of society, uh, virtually homeless people, that the only, the only health care they got was from this particular practitioner. <clears throat> and the doctor felt that at least getting prescription drugs was better than, than using street drugs. At least the, the dosage was known. I mean, no one really knows what the dosage is in uh, street drugs. It could be laced with uh, Chinese fentanyl. It could be fatal. And uh, after an investigation, uh, frankly, the state uh, closed it pretty quickly and, and, and gave the doctor a pat on the back. So, but again, uh, we're talking about charts that were very well, uh, very, very well um, documented terrible situations and the doctor was doing the best that the doctor could do now it does say that confirmatory tests should be used often uh when the clinical implications for the patient exists that uh if it need be you could take tests for specific opioids uh, and other drugs within a class uh, such as those being prescribed when you feel that it's necessary um when you, it, they can't be identified on standard immunoassays, assays, I should say, immunoassays, or need exists to confirm an unexpected screening toxicology uh, test result. So again, it's the practice, it's the art of medicine. It's not just the science of medicine. Before starting opioids and periodically, at least annually, during opioid therapy, clinicians should consider the uh, taking the toxicology tests. And again, check your local state rules. All right, that's important. Um, now, the actual guidelines do say that in most situations, initial toxicology question, uh, testing could be performed with a relatively inexpensive amino, amino assay uh, test kit that tests for opi opiates and benzodiazepines as classes and multiple non-prescribed substances. Patients prescribed oxycodone or non-morphine-based opioids, such as buprenorphine or methadone, require specific testing for those agents. The use of confirmatory testing can add costs and should be uh, only used when toxicology results <coughs> will inform decisions with major clinical or non-clinical implications for the patient. Got that now? And I would list what those implications are on your chart. That will help protect you for investigations that have been going on by various insurance companies and Medicaid and Medicare as far as overuse of various types of uh, UDTs or, or various types of uh, toxicology tests. Okay, now let's go to recommendation 11, the next to last one. Clinicians should use particular caution when prescribing opioid pain medication and benzodiazepines concurrently and consider whether benefits outweigh risks to prescribe the two together. That is very different than the gist of uh, the CDC guidelines in 2016, where frankly, many federal agencies were um, <clears throat> investigating physicians and medical providers they did use the two together. And indeed, uh, it says that in some circumstances, it might be appropriate to prescribe opioids to a patient who has also prescribed benzodiazepines. An example given uh, when a person's in acute pain on a patient that's already taking long-term uh, stable low-dose benzodiazepine therapy. The key here is stable. 
So a patient comes to you, or very often a patient comes to you and is on both pen, benzos and, and uh, opioids. And they've been stable. And they continue to be stable. Uh, and, and define what stable means and, and how you've come to the conclusion that the patient is stable on these medications. All right. So in specific uh, situations, benzodiazepines can be beneficial in stopping the benzodiazepines uh, might be deleterious to the patient. <clears throat> Matter of fact, the guidelines actually state in the commentary to uh, to recommendation eleven that stopping benzodiazepines can be destabilizing. In addition, the experts note that long term stable use might be safer than erratic, unpredictable use of benzodiazepines, along with the opioids. Because of these considerations, multiple experts indicate that recommending extreme caution with concurrent prescription of opioid medications and benzodiazepines was more appropriate than a recommendation to avoid prescribing opioid medication along with benzodiazepines concurrently, which can be destabilizing. That's a significant change between the two guidelines. What they don't say is have fun prescribing the two of them together regardless of the situation. They don't say that, doesn't apply that. So you still have to practice good medicine regardless, all right? But that is a, specific, a very specific, uh, significant difference between the two guidelines. <clears throat> now we're coming into the last uh, recommendation. That's 12. Clinicians should offer or arrange treatment with evidence-based medications to treat patients with opioid use disorder. Detoxification on its own without medications for opioid use disorder is not recommended for opioid use disorder because of increased risk for resuming drug use, overdose, and overdose death. A, what they're saying is, if you're going to uh, treat opioid abuse disorder, have credentials in what you're doing if you are going to do it. And if you don't, refer it out. And if you get, if you're not credentialed and experienced in this area of medicine, I would strongly suggest you refer these patients out and why you're referring them. Very, very important. All right. Um, they're also telling you that they do not, and they've said it before, do not go, uh, do not prescribe cold turkey for your patients. That can be very deleterious to your patient's health. So we've covered the 12 recommendations. Let's take a, a look at the overview. All right. The overview is good medicine, very good documentation. Always have a reason for doing what you're doing, whether it's upping the dose, lowering the dose, adding some kind of non-opioid therapy, whether it's physical therapy, some other, something else, pain pump, you name it. There should be a good reason. Here's another thing, and it is touched in with the 90-something pages of this guideline. All too often, all too often, I read records where it states back pain and you give a prescription. That's not enough. Lower back pain is not enough. What is the etiology of that back pain or that lower back pain? Often, the patient has never really found out the etiology. Oh, maybe they were in an accident. What was the diagnosis? Was, was there, was there uh, spinal stenosis? Was there uh, herniation of a disc? Spinalithesis, uh, it's too early in the morning to pronounce that word. <laughs> what was the cause of it? Was it a sprain, a strain, an old fracture that didn't heal properly? I mean, I have to tell you, in a large percentage of the charts that I review, when it's not only me, we don't know. Now, if I don't know, the state doesn't know either, and the insurance company doesn't know. 
and they're going to say all well, the treatment was not required. So we get down to why are you giving the opioids in the first place? Well, yes, to treat the pain, but what's the cause of the pain? And it may require interval MRIs, CAT scans, x-rays, ultrasonograms. I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to tell you clinically what you have to do. I'm not, that's not my, that's not the reason why I'm here today. But referrals to an orthopedist, the neurologist, a PMR, uh, you know, physical medicine, rehabilitation physician. You have to see what the cause is in order to get what the most effective treatment is. That's like saying someone has a headache. What kind of headache? There are, you know, very diff there are many different types of headaches and they're treated differently. You don't treat a migraine headache the same way as, as, a, as, a, as a cluster headache. Well, in the same way, you might have 10 different or more causes of lower back pain and they're treated differently. And some may require surgical intervention. Well, maybe for some reason the patient can't have surgery. And this is what the orthopedist or neurosurgeon recommended. And you take it from there. And every once in a while, have the patient go back to uh, that specialty to be reevaluated. Did it get worse? Did it get better? Did, did it change? Uh, depending on what happened in the interval, you, it may change or affect your treatment plan. And there should be more to your treatment plan than just prescribing pills, in, at least in most cases. <laughs> or at least in many cases, depending upon your practice. I can't stress that enough. Now that's not specifically in any of the uh, 12 guidelines, but I'm telling you, if you don't address good, bad, or indifferent, the etiology of the pain that brought the patient to your office to begin with, not only is your, is your care of the patient lacking, but your, your chart is gonna be lacking too, and it's gonna cause you problems. Do not be afraid to refer these, these patients, these pain patients, to, to get other opinions, to uh, get copies of the, of the reports. Make sure that they're considered in your treatment plan and, and it, your, your record should, show should so state. And you'll find that uh, things will go better for you. You're in a high-risk area when you're treating pain, especially with opioids these days. You want to get that target off your back as much as possible. And we've given you... Uh, several strategies this morning over and above the guidelines to deal with that. I'm available if you have any questions. You not only have my direct phone number on there, you have my direct email on there. Don't be afraid to give me a shout via email, phone call, uh, or by the uh, text message. I'll do my best for you. I cannot thank Robin Hoyle enough for all the work that she does, for all the pain society she's executive director of. Just a yeoman's job. Uh, please watch out for my weekly uh, weekly blurbs uh, called uh, Legal Briefs. And uh, we'll keep you up to date on the medical legal aspect of uh, the treatment of uh, medicine and pain. And I can't wait to see you again at the various uh, annual seminars that the various pain societies give. They're high-level seminars. You're going to have phenomenal providers that give you the latest and greatest as far as in the treatment of pain. And I'd like to thank you for the privilege of being the general counsel to so many of the pain societies. It's my true honor to meet uh, these physicians and, and, uh, and, and other healthcare providers that treat pain. It's a noble profession. It's a noble thing that you do. Don't let anyone ever tell you differently. Thank you so much. Hope to see you soon. And it was my pleasure to be here today. Bye-bye now.